In the very early hours of July 13, 1942, the men of Reserve Police Battalion 101 were roused from their bunks in the Polish town of Bilgorai. They were middle-aged family men of working and lower middle-class background from the city of Hamburg. Considered too old to be of use to the German army, they had been drafted instead into the order police. Most were rural recruits with no previous experience in German-occupied territories. They had arrived in Poland less than three weeks earlier. These men were driven to Josefov, a typical Polish village, also home to 1,800 Jews. The village was totally quiet. The men assembled in half circle around their commander, who informed them of the assignment that the battalion had received. With choking voice and tears in his eyes, Major Trapp fought to control himself. As he gave a speech that historians have reconstructed approximately, approximately in the following way. Our battalion has to perform a frightfully unpleasant task. I personally don't like this assignment, but the order came from the highest authorities. We have been ordered to round up the Jews of this village. The male Jews of working age will be separated and taken to a work camp. The remaining Jews, the women, children, and elderly will be shot on the spot. Having explained what awaited his men, Trapp then made an extraordinary offer. If any of the older men among them did, feel, did not feel up to the task that lay among him, he could step out. Most of you will have recognized here a paraphrase of the first page of Christopher Browning's landmark book, Ordinary Men. You then already know how the events subsequently unfolded. Out of 500 men, only 12 people stepped out. The remaining policemen who three weeks earlier were having dinner with their families after a worker day, workers' day participated in the ex execution of 1,500 Jewish children, elderly, and women at Josepho. The opening of the book, which I have paraphrased, already suggests that these mass murderers were not ideological extremists, since political statistics show that people with similar profiles were usually syndicalists, socialists, or communists. Neither had an extremist mindset, since they were well integrated in the society and that they had not been born for enough time to have been brutalized by the experience of occupation. If we describe this case study in terms of Kasim Kassam's trichotomy, we should say that Browning presents a scenario in which individuals, devoid of ideological or extremist mindsets and without being coerced, nonetheless resort to extremist methods or extreme violence, disproportionate and targeting innocent people. As the goal of my talk is to argue that Kassam's distinction between methodological on the one side and ideological and psychological extremism on the other reflects a real difference. And as Browning's case study suffices to prove their real separability, the evocation of this case, case study suffices to establish my claim. Thank you for your attention. We have plenty of time for discussion, but before I take questions, let me address one foreseeable reaction. This case study doesn't make sense. So why? Because these men did, what these men did is monstrous. And I am told, based on knowledge of their social and personal background, that these men were ordinary men. But I am myself quite ordinary. And if uh, someone is ordinary, I should manage to empathically understand her. This implies recognizing that in her situation, she made the right choice. However, not only I do not manage to understand these men, but it is impossible to understand them. The natural reaction uh, is then to reject the claim that these men were ordinary men. Instead of concluding from their political sociology that their action could not be motivated by ideological extremism, we should instead conclude that their actions, uh, from, uh, to conclude from their actions to their political sociology that they were ideological extremists. This is exactly the reasoning of another, another historian who had also studied the police battalion 101, Daniel Jonah Goldhagen. He concludes, the men of reserve police battalion 101 were not ordinary men, 
but ordinary members of an extraordinary political culture, the culture of Nazi Germany. In order to explain why they willingly participated in the murder, Paul Hagen claims that these men believed that all Jews were essentially malevolent to our German people, that they were omnipotent, children included. In other words, he claims that they were ideological extremists. So there are three possible responses to this objection. First, thoughtlessness. Analogously, analogously to Aaron's analysis of another apparently ordinary perpetrator, Adolf Eichmann, it could be argued that the men of Police Battalion 101 were thoughtless. That's, that is, that they did not manage to morally uh, evaluate their actions and their consequences. A second uh, position is to reject the second premise based on the fact that there are things that we could ourselves do that we do not manage to understand and predict. This interpretive strategy used by Brown in his book, followed by Roth and Stuber, is justified by the situationist and, causal, uh, and causalist interpretation of Milgram's experiments, according to which the situation in which we are causally determines our behavior. A third solution to this problem and, and response with this objection is to reject the claim that empathy of ordinary people with these mass murderers is impossible. So, so currently, uh, historian concurs that Aaron's misconstrued, misconstrued Adolf Eichmann motives, significantly weakening the thoughtless framework. Situationism has three weaknesses. Firstly, it relies on the agentic interpretation of, um, of Milgram, but this interpretation has been rejected since then. Secondly, situationalism regards the link between situation and action as causal and therefore renounces understanding that is grasping the agent's reasons for acting. This is therefore a last resort move, permissible only if our ability to take the uh, perpetu uh, 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 permissible, sorry, only when we are certain that we have tried all the alternative solutions. And finally, uh, situationalism hinders our ability to take the perpetrator's testimony seriously. Browning dismisses the perpetrator's accounts of their motives for participating in the massacre as mere rationalization. In contrast, Olivia Bailey and Kasim Kassam argue that empathy allow, allow us to um, take testimony seriously, thereby providing us valuable access to a valuable source of knowledge. The goal of my, the remaining part of my talk is to uh, make a case for the third solution. In order to do so, I will address four uh, questions. Um, the first question is how to um, overcome empathic failure. So to do that uh, implies to giving, to gi uh, giving a primer on how empathy works and to uh, try to offer a diagnosis of empathic failure and to propose a remedy. Second, how to describe the Yosefo situation. Third question, what problem should be solved to perform empathy? And fourth question, what are the possible solutions to that problem? In order to uh, respond to the first question, I will draw on uh, Stuber's analysis of empathy. So maybe I should make clear that uh, the kind of empathy he's talking about is not emotional empathy, but cognitive empathy. So um, in order to, uh, to, to, to do that, I will uh, um, use his book. And so Stuber works with Davidson's framework. So understanding someone's action implies grasping his or her reasons for acting. And what is, according to Davidson, quote, uh, understanding is, a so, quote, a reason rationalizes an action only if it leads to see something that the agent saw or thought he saw in his action, some feature, consequence of aspect that the agent wanted, desired, priced, held clear, so dutiful, beneficial, obligatory, or agreeable, end of quote. Stuber convincingly establishes that since reasons are dependent on context, we can grasp an agent's reason only if we imagine ourselves at her place. That is, if we use what he calls reenactive empathy. Stuber defines reenactive empathy uh, in Alvin Goldman's simulationist account of mind reading. So what is simulating someone's mind? So this is my mind with my be beliefs, my desire, my uh, uh, values. And when I simulate someone's mind, first I need to go through a matching case where uh, I put myself, imagine myself in someone else's situation. 
then I must deliberate as if I were this other person. And finally, I attribute the results of uh, my deliberation to this person. Reactive empathy is the process that leads from the matching phase to the attribution phase. The explanatory reenactment process aims at seeing why agents thought uh, a decision was the best possible option. The process depends on two necessary conditions. First, co um, contextualization. We, why? Because we must have enough information about the target situation. But the second condition is quarantine. We must manage to quarantine our own states of mind, our beliefs, our values, and our desires. Let's focus on the consequences of this last condition. Whereas it's difficult to quarantine our beliefs, it's, not, it's easy to quarantine our beliefs and desire. We can pretend other beliefs and other desire. It is impossible or it is very difficult to quarantine our moral values. Therefore, when the simulation, in the simulation phase, uh, when in the simulation phase I consider that um, a possible decision would have harmful consequences on others, without being able to come up with a contextualization that would make such a decision acceptable, I am unable to imagine myself in making such a decision. The simulation phase is jammed up. Right. Um, so this is what is happening. Kathleen Stock uh, has argued that you can bypass cases of imaginative resistance when additional contextualization is provided. In Stuber's framework, this means that in order to reach understanding in cases that elicit at first imaginative resistance, we could provide more contextualization. I call deep empathy an empathic understanding resulting from bypassing imaginative resistance that is a first failure of empathy. Deep empathy goes beyond surface level understanding or empathy, reaching comprehension through the effort of overcoming certain mental, barrier, mental barriers. So then I come to my second question. So how should we re-describe the Yosefov situation in order to understand the perpetrators? Browning's ident identification of Yosefov as a monstrous variation of Milgram's experiment provides a cue. In a forthcoming paper, I have argued, I have offered a new interpretation of Milgram results, sorry for the advertisement, arguing that the subjects were provided with good reasons to believe participating in the experiment was the right thing to do. Following this cue, we should pay attention to the normative structure of the battalion situation. However, in the, the Josepho situation, the order was so monstrous that considering it immediately justified the conclusion that it was a moral duty not only uh, not to obey, but also to help the victims in virtue of a fundamental humanist principle. It was morally required not only from killing, but also to help the victims and protect, the, uh, from, and protect them from the killers. This moral clarity is so dazzling that it blinds us to the norms that could prescribe the opposite action. Therefore, in order to, justif to, um, to identify this norm, I, sh I will ask you to consider uh, situations where the given orders are not so monstrous, or are not monstrous at all. Suppose that the men of the battalion were ordered to perform a very exhausting, dirty, and absurd job, like killing all the mosquitoes in a swamp. Even though these men might not desire to do such a thing, they should recognize that their duty is to obey for two reasons. First, accepting recruitment into the order police uh, implied accepting the hierarchy and thus obeying orders. And second, Evading participation would create additional work for their comrades, which would be unfair. If we apply this in Josepho, the men could consider that they had a prima facie duty to obey the orders and help their comrades in virtue of loyalty and fairness principles. Taking into account this feature of the situation does not suffice to overcome our imaginative resistance. Even if we understand why they thought they had a prima facie duty to obey, we do not understand how they could disregard the duty to refrain from obeying. The humanity principle is so compelling that in their situation, uh, this, their situation should not even be framed as a moral dilemma. However, this result aids, aids in part, uh, articulating the problem that needs to be addressed um, uh, in order to, uh, to, to, um, to understand their behavior. 
So I will refer to this issue as the problem of the absurd resolution of the moral dilemma. So yeah, this is what is expected and what is observed. So that, that's why we have a problem. So the first possible solution is to, f to uh, uh, look for second order reasons that could justify the choice of social reasons over humanistic reason. The existence of such reasons such seems inconceivable as moral values are our ultimate justifications. A principle more supreme than our supreme principles would be required to justify limiting our moral values. Looking for a good reason to prefer a bad reason seems contradictory. So a second solution um, is uh, what I call semi-situationalism. So in a forthcoming paper, Knowing Monsters and Knowing Ourselves, I argue that situationism could provide a response to the absurd resolution problem. The situation, situation uh, focus, uh, focused the, the perpetua, perpetrator's attention on the actions they performed, on the norms, on the comrades, and prevent them from considering the victims. In his last paper, uh, Carsten Stuber has embraced a compar comparable perspective and explores, in, explores its implication. He concludes that we can grasp the prima facie reasons to follow order, but we cannot fully understand how these reasons could override the moral obligation towards the victims. To use his phrase, he claims that only a fragmentary uh, understanding of uh, the men of the battalion actions is possible. After defending this solution myself, I have come to find it uncon unconvincing, for it contradicts our available evidence. First, we know that these policemen displayed emotion while killing their victims, and thus they were aware of what they were doing. They, had, they paid attention to the victims. And second, as, as uh, um, uh, Carsten Stuber admits, this approach does not allow us to make sense of all the testimonies. For instance, there was this testimony of a, a former policeman at his trial. And he, uh, he says, I made, the, uh, I made the effort, and it was possible for me to shoot only children. For Stuber, this inescapably, inescapably causes imaginative resistance since he believes that no contextualization is provided that could help the readers to reconcile their moral values with the decision to be reenacted. So the last, uh, and this is the view that I uh, would defend now, is what I would call group fatalism. So that, the last solution to the absurd resolution, resolution problem is to argue that these men had reasons to see the sufferings and the death of their victims are not being really the result of shooting them. In order to see that, let's assume that some of these men really pondered what was the right thing to do from a moral perspective. Putting ourselves in their place and perceiving the situation involves not only considering the norms, nor merely considering what they currently perceived, but reconstructing the possible scenarios they could reasonably anticipate, given the perceived characteristics of their situation. We must imagine what they imagined. In order to imagine the consequence of their actions, they had to rely on their knowledge of their current situation. What were the relevant pieces of information they had? The battalion had received an order, and the officers, officers had decided to implement it. It was public knowledge that everyone knew this order. Twelve men had stepped out of line. Correspondingly, 488 had not. And this abstention manifested all the more certainly a consent from the subject's point of view, since they had been allowed to express their wish for exemption. Not stepping out line created a public knowledge that each had accepted the order. This created a form of commitment for each, as they could expect their comrades and the hierarchy to expect them to comply. In such circumstances, what were the consequences of refusal to kill that each man could reasonably expect? Each could expect, including those who stepped out of line, that their decision would make no difference for the victim. Since the hierarchy and the comrades had accepted uh, the task, each had to rationally expect that, if they refused to shoot their victim, the officers would, or, would order their comrades to replace them. What was only a rational anticipation at the time of trap speech became an observation at the time of the assassination. Policemen who were not emotionally able to continue shooting were continuously replaced by the other. 
So I just uh, want to give uh, the, uh, and there is um, an evidence for this interpretation. Uh, while dismissing uh, it as a mere ration, ration, rationalization, as a post, uh, post hoc statement that does not pinpoint the real cause of the decision, Browning relates a testimony that provides an evidence for this reenactment of the fatalist deliberation. I thought I could master the situation and that without me, the Jews were not going to escape their fate anyway. And then we can go back to the, the um, testimony that puzzles uh, Karsten Stuber. In this situation, in this situation, uh, the, the um, perpetrator was, was using the fatalist uh, fallacy and then he, we can take at face value what he, he's saying as both the mum and the kid would be, both, both the man and his kid would be killed in the next few seconds after his reflection. He was only trying to reflect what would be the most human decision to make. So I come to my conclusion, and then you already saw it.